Eventually, I'll get into spoilers, but I wanted to try to squeeze in two non-spoiler questions to start here. I was reading in the notes that you said sometimes uh, you wanted to lean into the tropes or cliches of the mythology, and then sometimes you didn't. So can you give me an example of one specific trope that you wanted to embrace, but then one that you felt was necessary to subvert in this movie? Um, things like, well, opening with a babysitter horror sequence. You know, you take these iconic movies like When a Stranger Calls, and, and you find influence and inspiration in movies like that. And then... So you've established something that people feel is a little familiar, and then you show them a twist at the end of our cold open that they didn't see coming. It's a very effective twist right there. It's so hard not to ask you spoiler questions right now, but let's get into this one non-spoilery to start, and then okay. maybe we can elaborate after. But I am very curious, how much did the trajectory of the story of this whole trilogy change from you know, original inception, day one of knowing you were making a trilogy, to what we wound up getting in ends ultimately? Um, I don't know how, I don't know that it changed in any radical form. There were things that we evolved when we were writing kills and Lori was bedridden because she would be, cause she's been stabbed in the belly a few times. Um, uh, I knew we needed to make a time jump or, or we decided after thinking about it, we were, there was a period of time where it was going to be all one linear continuous type of movie, but then she's, you know, then how are you going to get this climactic battle out of her so then we made decisions to evolve it and say okay there's a time jump between kills and ends and and it became a great opportunity and discovery of the fact that we can have an we can meet an optimistic Lori strode that has gone to therapy perhaps and she's decorating for halloween she's inviting this this holiday she's making pumpkin pies you know so we can see a Lori that's in many ways the opposite of the Lori that we met in 2018 and and to me that just becomes a discovery you get from workshopping the script with my beloved co-writers and talking to the actors, um, turning a camera on things that work and work less, and and then trying to sculpt something you feel like is the most satisfying. Obviously, Kills is just uh, kind of a chaotic art film middle chapter for me. Um, it's just a, uh, a Michael Myers opera. And then Ends, I just wanted to build to make sure I felt emotional i felt atmosphere um i felt romance like th there's it, it, i wanted it to be a, a love song to the fans uh and and i don't think anyone's going to see it coming they certainly wouldn't expect us to take some of the make some of the choices we've made can confirm um, i did not okay. i didn't see a lot of this coming all right i'm just going to put up the spoiler warning for our viewers if you have not seen halloween ends this is where you push pause you go see the movie then you come back to this exact link and push play and it starts right here so you're all set all right, I kind of want to open up that question to spoilers now as well. Is there any particular thing that happens in ends that, you know, caught you by surprise where the plan was to go, you know, path A, but all of a sudden you realize something and then had a pivot to B? I don't know that we ever have to, but one of the things we did on this, on ends, we had four writers, Danny McBride, Paul Logan, Chris Bernier, and myself. And so sometimes we'd get to a point and it would be choose your own adventure. And so we'd get to a point and say, okay, Corey is at the bottom of the staircase. Lori is upstairs. You go this way, I'll go that way, and then everybody explore an avenue. And so we have infinite drafts of these of these sequences. You know, not just a page one to page 90. I try to keep scripts about 90 pages. Like uh, It's not just a full script, but it's like, here we are now. I know we feel good here. You go here, you go, you know, and it's fun to do those explorations and then get together and we read everybody's and we workshop what works, what doesn't. And typically what wins is the one that I'm surprised by, the audacity of doing this, the, the unexpected version here, the twist there. Um, that just makes it more, for an audience, it just makes it more fun, I think. Can you give me an example of that, of you know, a set of pages you read where you're like, whoa, like I didn't think we were gonna do it, but that's a great idea and now we gotta pursue it. Um, Lori puts a gun in her mouth. One end, out like a light. Another end, Maybe not. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's, yeah. A, that's a big one there. Here's, here's another really big question with a movie like this. You made a Halloween movie and you hid Michael for a real, real long time. So what was it like figuring out, you know, how long you could actually pull that off for? And then what was the best way to like bring him back into the fold and, and earn the way you bring him back? It, it, it's still uh, a controversy today. I just watched the movie outside of a technical format, meaning in a sound mix or a color correction for the first time two days ago. Like we really just finished this movie. Um, so two days ago, and it's still 
I, I'm watching it and 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 I'm like, this we're we're asking a lot. But then when we, when we were in the editing room and we would do differently, it felt wrong. And so if, if you don't have an intuition, if you don't have a vision, you shouldn't be making this movie. And I think uh, there's there's obvious challenges and things that you would um, would bring to discussion with editors, with producers, and say this is what this is what feels right. And at a point, we all just looked at each other and said and said we're taking a big risk here, but it does feel right, and we know what we're getting into. Let's go for it. Okay, so that's part one of a, a big risk with a Halloween movie. Part two of that is you, you kill Michael Myers. So what was it Do like? Do we? I mean, you, so I mean, I'm very hung up He's on, died on before. The, the line of uh, the idea of you know the the shape of evil changing. That's that's a, an idea okay. that's very exciting to me. But you know, at least in this specific okay. movie, you're so leaving you, us with you that, that feeling. That's a fun one. Oh to... yeah, I do. I dig that quite okay. a bit. But what was it like doing that and? you know, having some confidence that diehard Halloween fans out there are going to appreciate that, not necessarily go like, like, how dare you make it, make it feel at least that definitive. When we're filming that definitive moment, there are, are 200 people standing around a mechanism watching that. And it's, you could hear a pin drop. It's, a, it's this loud ass grinding mechanism. And there's not one person that's making any noise at all. It's just total silence. And that's kind of when we were all hypnotized by what's happening. And I felt like, because most of the production of this movie is, in all these movies, are just explorations. We're trying things. We're seeing if this looks like, do we want to show this? Let's film it anyway. Let's have it in the editing room. Let's play with it. And so the whole movie is those types of playful considerations. In that scene in particular, we were just mesmerized. And then when we looked at it and it worked and it's beautiful and strange and quiet and if, you know, again, you got you got to stick with some direction that you're going, and that one just felt peaceful in a way. My brain is conditioned to think that the killer can come back. This is probably one of the most definitive feeling endings to uh, a, like a slasher icon story to me. I was very very blown <laughs> away by how you really just went for it, like a hundred percent and beyond. Um, with that in mind, I kind of wanted to loop in Exorcist. What what is something about the way you're bringing back that franchise that stays consistent with having brought back Halloween, but then also what is something that that particular story demands that's unique to how you brought back Halloween? It, it's inevitable but that since I'm making these franchise returns kind of back to back, it's inevitable people will compare them, but they're nothing alike. That there's Halloween is a is a a is a horror film. It's a slasher movie. It's a it's midnight madness. Good time at the movies. Eat some popcorn. Exorcist is a very researched s drama uh, about fucked up things, and, and so uh, it, it, spirituality, religion, mental health, um, uh, family, and and it's um, there's a, you can overlap those two in these very different subgenres of horror. But the approach technically, creatively, is very different. The, the similarity is we're taking Chris McNeil, the Ellen Burstyn um, created that character in 1970, and we're taking a 50-year, uh, so 50 years later, we're, we're checking in on her again and seeing where she's a part of this ensemble. The, 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 the leads of the film are Leslie Odom Jr. and Ann Dowd, and... Uh, and, and uh, yeah, and a great ensemble of actors that we've, I can't say them out loud because I don't think they've been announced yet, but, uh, and then, and then Ellen is a part of that journey, returning to that role. And it's just, so it's just, for me, I love having an anchor of perspective. And so I feel like I'm dealing with, this isn't historical subject matter, but I'm dealing with historic cinematic characters. And I've got the iconic actress that played this part 50 years ago and she's there to ask questions. She's there to evaluate, give me notes on the script. And she's become like my spiritual guru that I go to. She's traveled the world. And that the, just the way that the film affected her life, we found ways that the story that we're creating um, affected uh, Chris McNeil in certain ways. So, 
was going to ask a broader question about knowing when to bring something back and when a franchise should end. But someone recently uh, told me this quote from Joe Wright about uh, like you shouldn't take on a new script or a new opportunity unless you think you have a secret about that story. So what is your secret about The Exorcist that's uniquely well, you? You have one year before you get to learn my secret. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. I'll take it. I know I got to wait sometimes. Um, speaking of the future or the potential future of this franchise, I was reading a quote that I think you had gave like a year ago where you were explaining how like you had your fun and now it's time to say goodnight to the franchise and move on. But you're basically leaving this mythology open to a new creator to tap in and explore it more. What would you want to see in a new writer, director or whoever? What qualities do you think they need to have to continue exploring the ideas that you leave us with? And ends. Well, see, if I had that idea, then I'd just keep doing them because they're so much fun to make. Um, I, I just, uh, again, I think that like we've tried to be very honorable and authentic. So the next thing should be Kabuki. You know, the, the next story could be uh, a, a Bollywood musical of it. You know, I, I, I think uh, I'd watch it someone should take a radically different approach than I did and, and prove me wrong and give me something to argue about. And, and I want to get into that fan spot again where I'm just sitting in the audience being like, boo, yay, I love it, I hate it. You know, I want to get back in that form because that's that's where the real adrenaline is. As know? much as I'm eager for you to keep making movies, now you have this platform and you can find another up and coming filmmaker who can absolutely crush it. I like I love it too. seeing that kind of support happen. And, and, and Malika Khad, who, uh, who owns the property um, with Trankus, like, uh, I. Like I just I know that he's thinking already. I know. I mean, he's he's a, a wonderful mind and been a great collaborator on this. And I just know that he's like, what's next? And and I think it's a really important decision he's got to make. I'll squeeze in one last question before they kick me out of here. And I, I specific, it's like more theorizing. And I don't know if you're going to want to explain this away, but it's specifically about Corey. Do you think that he was he was basically doomed from the very beginning. Had that incident at the beginning of the movie not happened, do you think he would have found a better path in life or would he have ended up where we see him end up anyway? My, my argument, and the, the film kind of poses that same question and I like I like that the film doesn't, 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 answer, doesn't it. answer it. But my answer is if it hadn't been in Haddonfield at that time of communal collapse, I think there would have been people to turn to because he didn't have a mother he could turn to in that problem. Uh, I think he would have had people he could turn to that could have uh, manifested positivity as opposed to evil. All right, it all builds. I didn't get the wraps on. I want to ask one more question because this is like one of my biggest burning questions now. Was there ever a version of this trilogy where Karen made it to ends? No, she was always toast. <laughs> Damn. Don't tell Judy. I love Judy so, so much. <laughs> I'm always too. rooting for her. Like, I wanted her to come back as a ghost. I don't care. Do any, like, cliche break, any role you want. I just wanted her back. I know. I, I was texting with her the other day being like, I got to show you this movie so you can punch me in the face. 